lower, 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 whatever that was, if that's what you're going to, yeah, don't worry about that. As long as you can do the RAM, LRAM, and MRAM. 10. Yeah. Okay, so all 10s want you to do, so as you went through and you got this chart in number nine, right? And I, I hope you used your program for this on your calculator. Um, and then you had, it was for 10, 50, 100, and 500. And that's nine? But you had to use nine for 10. So 10 says make a conjecture about the area of region R. So all of these are approximations of region R, right? And I'm just going to copy what they have in here. I'm going to assume this is what you got. 1.32, 1.34, 1.32. Is that what y'all had? 1.3328, 1 1.3336, 3, and so as you as you increase the number of intervals, what's happening here? They get closer to the same number, and all three of them get closer to the same number, right? So if you had to guess or make a conjecture or I don't know how many threes that is, whatever, it's a lot. One, two, three, four. That's too many. One, two, three. If you had to guess, what does it look like those numbers are going to. Oh! All right, y'all, somebody asked. Let's see. We were like, how old is this? Uh, this is old. This is yesterday and this is today. Y'all want to warm them. Right here, it feel cold. Huh? It was downstairs. I forgot to go get it. Okay. Because I forgot to get it. Don't show me. I would say one and a third. It's getting closer to one and a third. And I would say to estimate a good conjecture or a good guess is that the, the actual area under the curve would be one and a third. Does that make sense? That's all they're asking. It looks like it's getting closer to that. Number nine. You could. Um, okay. Maybe I'll just set it up for you instead of doing all of them for that for ten. Okay. So if I wanted to do, the question is if I had to do this by hand, and this is one that you could very well have to do by hand. Um, I would say you wouldn't have 10 subintervals for this if you were doing it by hand. I think n equals four is a good, which is what you had to do in seven, right? But they asked you to do LRAM. And so I think, I guess your question is MRAM, if you don't remember how to do MRAM. Okay, so first thing I would do is graph it. Um, zero, zero. I think, I feel like we graphed this one before, did we? Um, if I put in one, I get two minus one, which is one. So one, one. Then if I put in two, I get zero. So this graph looks something like this. So region R is here. This is region R. Yes? Um, so depending, what would you say you want to do, MRAM? Okay, let's divide it into four sections, four intervals here. So if n equals four, then the width of each one, I'm going from zero to two, right? So what's the width of each one half? Because I do high minus low, divided by how many intervals I want. If I wanted 10 intervals, I'd divide it by 10. If I wanted two intervals, I'd divide it by two. But since my n is four, I'm dividing by four here, so I get a half. So that tells me my width each time is one half. So one half, one, this will be one and a half, so I'm gonna do three over two, two. <clears throat> but if I move into MRAM, for MRAM, because you can see your divisions here, your partitions, right? Each one of them. 
But if I want MRAM, that means I'm going from the middle of these two. So I first have to calculate the midpoint, which would be what? One, four. That happens halfway in between. That's going to be the height of my rectangle. So what I need is I need one fourth, and then this is going to be whatever I get. What's f of one fourth? What do I get whenever I plug into that equation? What do you get? No, that's perfect. But you did this. You didn't even have to do it by hand. You did it. Oh. It is number eight. Yeah. All right, so then if I go to the next, and, and here, I couldn't see. You had your head bent down a little bit, and so I couldn't see. So, because I know that the width, and sometimes this will really help you, because I know that the width is a half, it doesn't really help here because it's easy, kind of easy numbers to work with. But I could just go over that width to the next one. In other words, add a half to it. So a quarter plus a half would be three quarters. Or you can look and you can find the middle between here. So then again here for the midpoint, I need, this is going to be three-fourths. And then if you plug three-fourths in, what do you get? Fifteen over six. There's my next rectangle. And then because this is a parabola and it's symmetric, this should be pretty easy because I should get um, the same height there for those. So LRAM and RAM would be using the left point. Do you need me to add it or you know how to add it from there? You just need to know how to find those heights. Okay. Um, the difference here, if I was doing, let's say, left RAM, then I would take, my width is still the same. So I started, I started the beginning. And I go over the amount of the width, right? LRAM says, let the height of your rectangle be the left endpoint. So left endpoint, left endpoint, left endpoint, left endpoint. So this is what LRAM would look like. Start from the left end of your boundary. Right RAM would be the right end. So what you're adding each time is it's always going to be your width, which is the same each time, right? So I can do the width and just multiply it all together times each height for however many heights that you have. And your height is going to depend on which RAM you use. So if I'm doing M RAM, my width is still a half, right? And then my height is going to be 7 over 16 plus 15 over 16 plus 15 over 16 plus, what is it, 7 over 16. And I would add those together and go there. LRAM would be, again, using those left, so this would be the point zero zero. This point would be one half, and then whatever you get when you plug one half in, I don't know what you get. One minus a quarter. What is it? Three fourths. Okay. So it would be left gram would be right. You wouldn't start here. Instead, you start here. Yeah. Does that make sense to everybody? What else? I got to cut that heat off. Straight upward from sea level with an initial velocity of 400 feet per second. Assuming gravity is the only force acting on the object, given up, oh, this is upper estimate. For its velocity after five. You don't need that. You don't need it. Mm -mm. We're going to get to some 
we'll get to some analysis where we start talking about if the function, based on the concavity of the function and if it's increasing, decreasing, we'll touch on a little bit if LRAM would be like an overestimate or an underestimate or a, an appropriate. Remember, you know what I'm talking about, where it gives you too much or too little or whatever. But this this particular type, no. Yeah. Are they the same thing or no? no. Oh, here we go. This is kind of what we were talking about. Um, if a positive continuous function on the interval a, b, which of the following rectangular approximation methods has a limit equal to the actual area under the curve from a to b as the number of rectangles approaches infinity? So, in other words, think back to that one we did, this one. You made that conjecture and you said, ah, I think the actual area, because as I add more and more and more rectangles, right? These are actually my rectangles. As I add more and more and more, it's getting closer and closer to the actual area. So which one gives you the actual area as you add an infinite number of rectangles? All of them. They're all converging to the same number. They're all getting closer and closer to the same number. So all of them would. So one, two, and three, which is does that make sense? And we're going to talk about this today. This is going to be what we do today with an infinite number of rectangles. It's such fun. Yes. A truck moves with positive velocity, V of T, from time 3 to 15, the area under the graph um, of Y equals V of T between 3 and 15 gives what? So here we're going, if we're talking about velocity and we're talking about the area under the curve, remember area under the curve gives the antiderivative, that's going backwards. So what's the antiderivative of velocity? Position. So it would give, but yes, position, but because you're going, because you're talking about everything under there so you're adding it all together you're talking about the distance all all together what it is if you looked at the antiderivative at a particular point yeah that would be position but because you're looking at it over this whole interval and you're saying i want all the positions from this interval it's giving the total distance does that make more sense to me it makes sense to, to me to think about it being shaded so i'm talking about a bunch of stuff all together Uh, D. Thing out. Y'all okay? All right. I put it not due until three thirty, so you can submit it if you need to a little bit later. Huh? So how about what? Yeah, I made it three thirty today, so you can get it. All right, y'all ready to talk about some Riemann sums? Okay. I'm gonna start, do you? Some people love it and some people hate it. We have really I hate Riemann sums, but I like everything else. I don't even know if Riemann has two ends or one. It's two. All right, so before I get into Riemann sums, let me back up and tell you something that I, you really need to know about area under the curve. Let's say, so far we've only dealt with curves that, that happen above the y-axis, positive value curves, right? We've looked at parabolas, like upside down parabolas, but everything's up top. But what happens if I have something that looks like this? And I need the area under the curve. So it's still, well, you do. You, you would separate it absolutely. This is two different areas here. This I'm going to call region one. This would be region two. But I still go up to the x-axis because that's still how I measure area is from curve to x-axis. That definition stays. It's just x-axis to curve or whatever. So it's still the function value, right? Because any point on here would be my f of x. That's the, the height or whatever of my rectangle that it would be. The difference now is what happens is if it's above the x-axis, this is positive area, and that's what I've been doing. But on here, this is going to be a negative value. Now, 
Two different ways I could ask. I could ask for the integral that we're going to talk about in just a minute. Integrals can be negative, but if they specifically say area, area is never negative. So as we get into doing this on our calculator and things like this, it may shoot you a negative value. And I wanted you to understand that if it's below, then yes, the integral is negative, but, and, and I know I haven't introduced the integral yet, but the integral is negative, but actual area can never be negative because that wouldn't make sense, right? What's the area of a rectangle? Negative 15, that doesn't make sense. So area's gotta be positive, but that's where the negative's coming from if it falls below the axis, and I can still do that. Does that make sense? Everybody okay, all right. So let's talk about a Riemann sum. Oh, okay. Have you guys, and you should, well, I'm not even going to say that you've seen this. I've never been able to get to it in algebra. Okay, you saw it yesterday. You saw it in Khan Academy. All right, so. Did they? It was good. Those were easy, I thought. Okay, okay. So you understand what this means, that this means taking the sum of something. Right? And at the bottom, it tells you where to start. And up top, whoa, it tells you where to end. Right? And then it gives you some function or some, some something. Um, and you would plug in like the first value of K1. So it would be A, this would be A sub 1 plus A sub 2 plus A, and you would count up until you get to this value at the top. Da, da, da. So before yesterday, had y'all ever seen summation notation like this? Okay. Y'all didn't do sequences and series in Algebra 1? Or sequences oh, no, using this? With, it but it wasn't, you didn't use the, ring, the summation notation. Okay. So it's called summation notation. And if, as you can probably see, this is going to relate back to my rectangles a little bit, right? Because I'm adding these particular things together each time. Yes, no, maybe so. Let's look at it in terms of a... In terms of a rectangle and a, I'm trying to think of the easiest way I think so to show you this. If I have, let's take the same what I started with and let's call this f of x. What do you mean that? Why are you throwing this one? What? This is the beginning. It was just an example of what it would look like finding the area under the curve. I'm trying to think if I should go rogue off the book and show you. Integral notation first to make it make more sense. Did you learn this yesterday? No. Okay, I'll skip it this way. Then. And I'm actually going to start this. I'm going to start it here. I'm going to call this A. I'm going to call this B. And I'm going to start just up top here. Of course, we could go over to the, but just to stick with what you know, I'm going to stick with from A to B. So what I could say, if I wanted the area under this, and let's, let's say we're doing... Gosh, I don't want to get into too much and confuse you. Really. What did they do? Left ram, right ram, or they did all of it with the Riemann sum? Okay. If I want to find the area under, and we'll start with let's start with left ram then. I've got these rectangles. I don't know how many, I'm just going to call it in number, right? Do we all agree this is a left frame, right? I'm going from the left side and I'm moving over. So if I want to find this area, I would do the width times, how do I find the height here? I put it in the equation, that's exactly right. So I'm going to call this F of,
Uh, yeah, but if that's the way they talk to you with it. Okay, I'm going to just show you, this is not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the actual definition and I'm going to set this up the way I think you'll understand it. So I plug in, this is my left endpoint each time, right? That's how I find that left endpoint. This is changing, this is constant, agree? All right. If I call W, I'm going to relate them all back to X's so that I can get an equation for this. I'm going to call that delta X, would that make sense? Why? What's delta X mean? Change in X. That's the width of each one. That's how much each X changes. Is that what they did yesterday, delta X? Okay. Okay, so delta X is my width. That's the width of each rectangle. So what I really want to do now is I want to take delta X and I'm going to times that by F of, and then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to find some value. Okay. Miss Matthews needs to ask y'all something. I'll use the I, I'd imagine. Okay, I'm just going to show you the way that makes sense to me. I'm going to call this new point C, and I'm going to say C sub K, because what I want to do is I want to add up all these rectangles, right? So I'm going to do this little summation notation, and I'm going to say start when K is 1. Not that I'm starting at 1 on X, because I don't really know. I want this to work for any values I put in. So I'm going from A to B, but what I want to say is I want K to be 1. So I want the very first value there. In other words, for this one, it would be F of A, right? Y'all following me? Okay. And I want to go until I hit N, whatever N is. That's my number of intervals, right? That's how many I got. So if I've got four, then this would be F of C sub one. That would be my very first height rectangle. And then F of C sub two would be my second height rectangle, and so on until I got to N. Does that make sense? Wait, wait. Well, so this is just in general, because remember, I don't really have here, I don't really have a function itself. This is just a general sum. It, it really doesn't, depending on... Yeah, no, I would just. What is, what is C? Okay, C isn't. It's, it's the function. Right, right. And is that the number that you go to, or how many like numbers there are? Like, That's how many intervals there are. So if it's at four sub intervals, this would be from one to four. Okay, so let me just, right, let me show you, and I'm going to pull this straight from your homework because that way you see the way it's going to work. Now, okay. this is number one. I'm just going to do it. I guess I should say this about it as well. Remember we talked about the actual area is if I can get this to be as big as possible. So the actual area is going to be if in front of this I throw in this little limit. So if I say the limit as n goes to infinity, so if I can get an infinite number of rectangles, I can actually get the area. This is the equation without this for the Riemann sum. And we're going to relate that back to the actual integral in just a second. I realize it feels like I've been talking. Sometimes I feel like these are kind of hard to conceptualize, but when you see it in the form of a problem, it's not nearly as hard. For example, What's not right? Tell me, I have not shown you the integral yet, so you can't do this whole problem, but if I just showed you this, 
tell me what you think the equation, not, I don't want to know anything other than what equation am I trying to find the area under. I want to see if you can see that in here. X squared, X squared, that's exactly right. This would mean f of x is x squared, and I am finding the area under x squared here, right? Are y'all okay there? Um, how about this one? Let me not do this second one. It's half the problem. And half the battle is, we're going to add the limits in the middle in just a second, but the hardest part for me is identifying what the function is. Once you find the function, it's easy to find the area under. What would f of x be? Square root of 4 minus x squared. So in other words, that's why I said if you saw it, you'd look at it and go, well, this is stupid. The hardest part is going from here to here, not here to here, but this is the way we're going to start is going this way first, okay? Identifying that function. Is everybody okay there? If I give it to you this way, can you identify the function? Can you identify f of x? Yeah. Give them room to Okay. So how are we going to use this? Which is going to, you may have one multiple choice question using Riemann sums. The, this summation notation, two at the most, Important part here in takeaway is going to be your integrals. We're going to take the same two, so leave a little bit of space there for those. The integral is the area under the curve, okay, and that's what we've been doing. The difference is, remember, I told you integrals could be positive or negative. That's the difference. So if we could. Given infinite number of rectangles, we would have the value of the integral. Okay, and here's how we do. This funny looking S, okay, this is the whole second half of calculus, y'all, which you're fixing the line right here. Isn't that exciting? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, it is. We have these values. This is what we call the lower limit of integration. In other words, where I start. This is my upper limit, in other words, where I end or where I stop. No, that, my pen just slipped. In here, I'll have some function f of x followed by that dx. And that dx starts to look familiar, right, from the first half. <clears throat> This dx in summation notation is my delta x. It's my width of each one. It's that same thing as I go. So what this says is this says I have some function f, right? Whatever f is, maybe it looks like, I don't know, this. Here's a, here's b. It's the area from A to B. That's all that is. The area under the curve from A to B, if this is f of x. And whatever f of x is, this is how we denote it. You start wherever, because I could find the area under any part that I wanted to. I could say, what's the area from between 5 and 7? So it just depends. You could start wherever you want. So if I go back to those two that I just showed you here, and let's say I told you I think they even give you the intervals here, from 0 to 2, how could you write that using an integral now? You've already identified f of x. So I do my little integration, 0 at the bottom, 2 at the top, x squared, dx. You have to follow with the dx. There it is as an integral. These mean the same thing. This was given in the problem, 0, 2. So you try this one. Number 5 tells you to go from 0 to 1. So see if you can write the integral for that. I 
That's your delta x. That's your width of each rectangle. So in summation uh, notation, uh, that's what it looks like. But in integral notation, it's your zero. And what's going to happen is we're going to start doing antiderivatives to go backwards to evaluate. Um, and it'll make a little more sense then, I hope. What'd you get? The integral from 0 to 1 of square root of 4 minus x squared. Yes. Easy? See why I was hesitant on how I was actually going to show you and what I was going to show you because it's you need to know, but you don't need to know some of that. Okay. Let's go backwards on it. Let me start you with an integral and see if you can find the area under. Where's the what? No. Well, I mean, yeah, because this is the whole second half of calculus. You're just dipping. Yeah, that's your function. Remember, because this is going to be f of, and we had it c sub k here, times right. So what would f of x be if that was f of c? That doesn't look like a very, that looks like it could easily look like an ugly word. Okay, well, we're just going to move on. <laughs> Was that y'all's class? Yeah. Oh gosh, I had gotten so nervous. Oh, they don't even. They don't even. It was like we were like. Oh, we have. We have somebody like whatever, like a person watching, like, so what's your favorite F word? And when we do factor, somebody says factor, Matt is like, that is not my favorite F word. <laughs> All right, let's think about what this means first, because I can actually evaluate this fairly easily if you think about it. All right, if I think about what an integral means, integral is area under the curve, right? So my first question here is, what is f of x? It's just f of x is just pi over 2, right? There's no variable in there or anything of the sort, and that's okay. So what I'm really doing is a constant. What does that look like when you graph it? A straight line, a horizontal line, right? Y equals is a horizontal line, X equals is a vertical line. So this is the graph of F of X equals pi over 2. Agree? Well, you're going to have to kind of graph it to see it. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Yeah. D theta. That means my variable is theta in this equation. But I don't have a variable in it, so it's okay. Whereas before I did dx because it was f of x, so I guess this is really f of theta would make more sense here. So now what is it? It's the same thing, yes. So now it's saying if you go from negative 18, okay, well, here's negative 18, up to negative 1, what's the area under the curve? Well, what kind of shape do I have here? It's just a one big rectangle. I can find the exact area under there. I don't have to divide this into smaller rectangles or anything of sort. I can use geometry to help me find the area of this, right? Length times width. Or height times length here. What's the height? It's always pi over 2. So it's going to be pi over 2 times 17. Should it be negative? No. Why? How do I know? It's area. Okay, but because of this, it could be negative also, but it's above the x-axis, which is why. If it was below the x-axis, it would be negative. If I said, what's the area, then you would make it positive. But I just said, tell me what the integral equals. Yeah. I thought you were putting it on to a 
Yeah, I definitely just went between two different problems pulling limits there, but it's okay. What? Well, I thought we were putting it on a Riemann. No, we didn't have to do a Riemann sum for that because it's a shape in and of itself. Look at this one. You don't use the Riemann sum a whole, whole lot. The summation notation is what I should have said that I don't want. Use you can rewrite any integral using summation notation. And what, what's the f? Absolutely. This is integral. So what's the e looking? The e looking thing is using the Riemann sums. The Riemann sums are the rectangles. The yeah. Riemann sums are the rectangles. All right, so here. Okay, so absolute value of x, what does that look like? You're okay. okay, that's like a v, right? So we know what that looks like. Let's graph it and look at it so we can tell kind of what we're looking at. Because by the way, the directions on this, they use the graph and areas to evaluate the integral. We know this is what the absolute value of x looks like, yes? I'm going from negative 2 to 1. Negative 2, which would be what on here? 2 to positive 1. So the area under the curve, it's going to be made up of two parts. It's going to be this and this, right? It's always down to the x-axis. Can you find that area? I say algebraically, but using geometry. Yeah. How do you do it? One half base times height. There's two triangles there, and just add them together. So the area of this one, one half, two times two, plus the answer is two. One half, one times one. Right, because this is absolute value of x. That's right. So the absolute value of negative 2 would be high. Which tells me that the height is 2. No, it's an empty. Yeah, because what I'm doing is just looking at the area of that triangle in general. Not The only time I'm going to worry about positive and negative is if it flips under the x axis. So this, of course, would be 2 plus half, 2 and a half, or 5 over 2 would be the area there. Does that make sense? Is it easy? A lot easier than what I was stumbling over to try to show you in the beginning. No, they're all, so look at, let's do one just a little bit harder. Then. Let's do, let's do 35 together. 35 is the integral from a to 2a. You didn't mean to go back? 5 over 2. These are the kind of questions that an AP exam loves. They're kind of cool, though, when you think about them. Use areas to evaluate the integral. So if I got to use areas, I need a picture because I need to see what I'm working with, right? Say right, that's right. Okay. So the graph of x looks like what? What's y equals x? Looks, x looks, it's just a line. What kind of line? Diagonal line right through the origin, right? And it says a is greater than 0, which means a is positive. So if A is positive, and that's my lower and upper limits, I'm sticking on the right side of the coordinate plane, right? I don't need anything over here because A is positive. Does that make sense? Okay. How am I going to write? Because all it does, it gives me these A's, right? It's saying I'm going from A 
up to 2a and it says use area to find, use an equation for the area. Tell me what you see here. Close. Trapezoid, right? If I start at zero, it would definitely be a triangle. Well, you don't, but does it matter? Because it's, it's conceptual, it's a, right? But I, need, I do know that it's greater than zero, not greater than or equal to zero, but greater than zero. So it's going to come off of zero a bit. So it's definitely going to be a trapezoid. Well, how do you find the area of a trapezoid? That's how you find the area of a trapezoid? What would y'all say? One half base one plus base two times height. So let's see, what is base one? Where are my bases on this thing? They're the heights that are going up essentially, right? That's why it's confusing on a thing on a coordinate plane. You have to kind of flip it over and look at it and picture it on its side. So essentially, this would be base one, this would be base two, or vice versa. It doesn't matter which one you let be what. But it's those heights running up are your two bases. It's always the two parallel sides. And then the height's going to be the difference that it spans there. So my area here would be one half. Base one is what? AX. Just A, right? Because Y is A. Every place go is S is A. Y is also A, right? Think about if that was one. If if this was a line Y equals X, and I said A was was one, what would you tell me the y was? One also, right? So this point is a a, which means this point is two a, two a, right? So this distance up is a, and this distance up is two a, right? You following with this? Just gets confusing because excuse me, the variables, but it's nothing you haven't done. It's just plugging in some a more generalized. Form here. So I've got A, that's base 1, plus 2A, that's base 2, times the height. Well, what's the height? A, how did you get that? That's right. The difference between these two, 2A minus A, is going to give you A. So this spans a distance of A. And now I could clean that up just a bit. 1 half times 3A times A, which would be 3 over 2. A squared. Wasn't that fun? Say yes. Because it was. 